Hi, everyone. Welcome to CMSMC's second symposium, Material Culture in an Increasingly Digital World. Um, I just wanted to take a moment and thank everyone for being here, um, especially on a Saturday morning. And depending on where you are, it might be very early. Um, so before I continue with my opening remarks, I would like to take a moment to recognize and honor the fact that I'm presenting from Haudenosaunee territory, specifically of the Ganyan Gahaga or Mohawk Nation, an area which is known today as New York State. For those who don't know, the Coalition of Master Scholars on Material Culture, or CMSMC, is a platform born online dedicated to helping emerging and established master scholars by providing a space to publish their work and contribute to the expanding field of material culture. CMSMC is a new organization and was created after we ourselves experienced the difficulties facing those with master's degrees in fields relating to material culture, especially during the pandemic. Funding, jobs, and other opportunities were and are scarce. We are not associated with the university and were run by fellow scholars. Our online pu publication is similar to an undergraduate review and we aim to fill a gap for those earning or possessing a master's degree. These scholars are often competing with doctoral students or established academics for publication in other journals. In the last eight and a half months that our site has been live, we have published over 25 articles with more in the works, had nearly 7,000 unique readers on our website and hosted our first symposium with almost 150 attendees. If you're wondering about ways to get involved or support CMSMC, there are several opportunities. Our Patreon offers helpful and exciting perks for those who join. We also have a bonfire store where we're currently selling CMSMC apparel and symposium specific merch like our Let's Get Digital t-shirts um, and also our History Should Make You Uncomfortable merchandise. Our spring symposium apparel will only be up for a short while so you should get, get it while you can. Um, we're completely funded by your support and so any financial contribution is extremely appreciated and it really does help support our mission. Um, we will also be hosting another symposium in the fall, so stay tuned for that. The title and details will be shared in the coming months. And we also have a number of uh, professional development and network event networking events, like our upcoming talk on cover letters and fellowships with Dr. Alyssa Butler. For our Spring 2021 symposium, we want to bring together a group of scholars who could speak to something that is relevant to the future of how we as scholars of material culture work especially in this day and age when so much has moved away from the physical and into the digital. This led us to our topic of material culture in an increasingly digital world. 2020 was a hard year for everyone, but in particular for those who handle things, objects, manuscripts, artifacts, material culture. How do we interact with objects that we can't touch or even see in person? It is estimated that in 2020, nearly 33% of museums were in danger of closing their doors for good. How are we meant to access our subjects of study if museums, archives, and even travel in general are not only temporarily limited, but potentially permanently extinguished? How can we study material culture when we can't even interact with one another? The digitization process has been slowly happening, but was forced to accelerate. And it made us ask ourselves a very important question. Can you ever really know an object or even a person without interacting with them in reality? And yet we cannot ignore the fact that this switch to the digital sphere makes knowledge more accessible than it's ever been. The sheer amount of methodology that has been created in the past year to overcome the obstacles of time, distance and disease have given us so many opportunities to connect with new people, attend seminars, experience digital exhibitions and truly create historical narratives that are open and accessible to the public. So how much further can human ingenuity and connectivity go? What is the future of material culture in an increasingly digital world? It is our hope that the conversation that ensues will help us chip away at these very difficult to answer yet very relevant questions. Now it's with great pleasure that I introduce our panelist. panelists. Erica Robert Paula will start our morning off with her presentation titled Digital Media as Intangible Material Culture of Women. Her research asks how the study of material culture of women can recover stories that have been misinterpreted, ignored, and silenced from the global historical record. Erica Robert Paulo earned her MFA at the University of Texas, Austin, where she focused on digital media and all st stages of film production. 
She earned a double BA in anthropology and interdisciplinary studies and currently um, from UC Berkeley and currently plans on pursuing her research as in a PhD program. Next, we have Claudia Eskew. Eskew's presentation will discuss the role of GIS in remote archaeological research, geospatial analysis of traditional taro farming in Rurutu, French Polynesia. Integrating geospatial analysis, Rurutuan oral traditions, and previous archaeological research, Eskew explores how Rurutu's modern taro terraces can illustrate pre-European contact Polynesian substance and inform modern decision-making on food sovereignty in Oceania and beyond. Claudia Eskew is, is earning her MA in Historic Archaeology from the College of Women, William and Mary, and some of her research interests include the archaeology of Oceania, geospatial information systems, ethnoarchaeology of traditional farming. She earned her BA in Anthropology from the University of Colorado Boulder. We will also hear from Anna Talley presenting a disorderly archive, digitally archiving pandemic design on design in quarantine. Tally, with her co-founder, Fleur Elkerton, established Design in Quarantine, an online archive founded in April 2020, to document, preserve, and provide a research resource in real time for design responses to the coronavirus pandemic. Tally's presentation will discuss the range of responses across design disciplines, such as graphics, architectural concepts, product and furniture design, and bespoke craft during these challenging times, as well as chronicle the, prog and pro the progress and future of Design in Quarantine. Anna Talley got her MA in the History of Design from the Royal College of Art and her BFA in the History of Art and Design from the, pa from the Pratt Institute. Next, we have Kale Avery's presentation titled History as Database, Bioshock and the Significance of the Composite Digital Object. Avery's, Avery confronts the inherent complexity of historically inspired digital objects in games like Bioshock, arguing that composite digital works should be described in more complete terms and that their very existence is indicative of a broader postmodern trends in creation and consumption. Kale is currently earning his master's degree as the Lois F. McNeil Fellow in the Winterthur Program in American Material Culture. Abigail Eplett will share I Want Truth, Best Practices for Creating an Online Exhibit. Eplett's presentation will work through the problems and solutions of digital display of physical objects, best practices for online curation, and concerns for accessibility. Eplett is currently earning her master's degree in museum education from Tufts University. To end our panel, we will hear from our keynote speaker, Sherry Berger. Sherry, who will be further introduced by Sarah Henslick, will share a keynote address on the topic of the paradoxes of digital collecting. Finally, before we continue, I would love to send a really big thank you to our symposium committee, Perry Buke, Christine Staten, Reb Zhu, Molly Radford, and Sarah Henslick without whom this symposium would not have been possible even in the slightest. So without further ado, here is Erica Robert Paulo. Good morning, and I would like to thank everyone at CMSMC and my fellow panelists. It is an honor to open today's presentations, and I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. How does study of the material culture of women recover the missing stories that have been misinterpreted, ignored, and silenced from the global historical record? This has been my overarching question. More specifically, how can I communicate that research using adaptable digital platforms, such as blogs, to build on, and dare I say, enhance well-established anthropological practices? Researchers, especially anthropologists, should utilize all the resources at their disposal in the pursuit of knowledge. Since my backgrounds are in both anthropology with a focus on digital, di digitized cultural heritage and film and media production with a focus on visual and digital media, I keep a foot in each discipline, one in the tangible, the other in the intangible. I see an interdisciplinary approach to scholarship as an advantage, and I propose using digital platforms alongside physical objects as complementary anthropological examples of material culture. Separately, each tangible and intangible aspect of culture has narratives, 
but combined, they weave a richer story with details that may have been missed on their own. The creation of digitized versions of primary historical sources also opens up a new potential for research using advanced computational methods to show different facets, relationships, views, or details of the original content. My discussion today pushes against the established understanding of material culture as being solely objects one can touch, as things people leave behind. I wanna broaden the idea that objects that are born digital can also be called material culture. For support on this, I turn to some established definitions. A visual anthropology logically proceeds from the belief that culture is manifested through visible symbols embedded in gestures, ceremonies, rituals, and artifacts situated in constructed and natural environments. The process of digitization therefore brings forth a wholly new object into existence. The materiality of the original object is not lost. It is only translated into metadata and digital information. The digital object identifier, a DOI, is a system for identifying content objects in the digital environment. And the term object here is used in the accepted ontology sense of an entity which may be abstract, physical, or digital. Digital object identifiers are what you often use when citing online, an online academic source, for example, and are one recognized example of what is called a digital object. Here's where things get tricky. I wanna bridge the gap between the use of documentation for intangible digital platforms with that of tangible objects. Intangible digital records, representations, expressions, and knowledge begin life as data. In constructed environments, the data transform into digital objects and digital stories and entities of narrative metadata. Then intangible visible elements or entities are added to the digital objects and are converted into visible symbols, which hold cultural meaning. Thus, with the addition of the visible symbols, new objects, new material culture come into existence in these intangible digital environments. From this model, I am presenting a new working definition to scholarship. I assert that intangible digital platforms can become what I call intangible material culture. And I extrapolate my term, though I distinguish it from the concept of intangible cultural heritage, which UNESCO defines here as the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, skills, as well as the tangible material culture. My online blog, reinterpreted as an autoethnographic record, is one such intangible application and the primary topic of my presentation today. As a proof of concept, I have created a prototype blog that will be a portion of future doctoral study that I am proposing as an investigation into the material culture of women. More on that in a minute. To understand the use of my blog, I want to describe how it fits into my long-term doctoral dissertation that has not yet begun. Material culture contains many lost stories of women and female identifying persons missing from the global historical record. These omissions are the legacy of centuries of prejudice and male-dominated academic analysis undervaluing and muting the historical narratives of women. Racism, religious persecution, classism, and other discriminatory biases have also muff muffled their stories. Some objects were simply neglected, others were purposely destroyed. I plan to conclude my, do my doctoral research with the creation of an interactive data database application, a digital archive. Seen as believing, many say, and the database will illustrate and substantiate women's stories by contextualizing the works made by and about them. While I will eventually need to focus my, my, or narrow my focus, at this time, my aim is still in progress and I am combing the global historical record from prehistory until the end of World War I, 1918. I chose that endpoint since social conditions after the war incentivized women to move outside of the private sphere and to create more objects for use in the public sphere, resulting in a proliferation of material culture made by women. My intention is that the database will highlight objects from periods that often lack or have minimal visual records about women. I am not a trained historian, however. I see myself as a researcher whose role is to transcribe and archive these women's stories, thereby making me a caretaker of this knowledge, a guardian. 
my viewpoints are not absolute, to mitigate any internal beliefs and biases, I will defer to experts who know a per particular culture far better than I. To verify the authenticity of the material culture, I plan to consult with various specialists who can certify the details of the objects throughout all stages of my work. I also consider the database to be yet another example of intangible material culture. From here, I'm gonna click on a link. This link takes us to the prototype version of my actual database, which um, at the moment, as you see, it has a bunch of dots that are just the beginning. Um, alongside here, you can click on a person's name and it brings up the information. At the bottom here are different time periods. If you, you can actually zoom in and there are other ways of seeing it a little bit more clearly. You can go full screen or you can just go here. You can also zoom in and see various aspects. So right now there are not many women listed as I am just beginning my research, but I envision the final iteration of the database to be full of names and stories. Like what you see here, it will include a multidimensional interactive digital map and documented material objects as its main interface. There will be highly aesthetic video, photo, and audio content augmented with special considerations for visitors with visual and hearing impairments and clickable supplementary links. Audio narratives and soundscapes will amplify the visual components and bring the objects to life. I will consult with historians to write fictionalized stories that will be recorded in the women's native language, in English, and eventually in other languages. The narratives playing with the tap of a computer mouse. Besides archives, libraries, and storerooms, another reference location I will utilize will be crowdsourcing or an open call asking for not only academic sources to contribute ideas to my project, but also the general public. The collaborative nature of crowdsourcing will add examples of material culture to my research that have been dismissed by previous scholars and grant access to resources that I might otherwise overlook due to the logistical and budgetary restrictions of a single researcher working on her own. An added bonus, since I will create the database, it will fit the criteria of an example of intangible material culture made by a woman, me. So going back here. Until formal study begins on that database, the current prototype version of my blog acts as a testing ground to demonstrate ways of organizing and archiving cultural data into categories, allowing cross-referencing and preliminary analysis. It also tracks the progress of my investigation and acts as a self-reflexive auto-ethnographic record of my fieldwork and role as participant observer in telling the story of my research. What is autoethnography? It is an approach to research and writing that seeks to describe and systematically analyze personal experience in order to understand cultural experience. That means that the blog is a tool of research and also an example of intangible material culture created by a woman, me again, and I will take you to the blog now. All right, so this is the main interface of the blog. Again, this is a working prototype. Um, every page has uh, information down here, but they also carry these little boxes that if you click on them and they do expand, um, it gives you a little taste as to what is still to come, what I know I need to work on. Down here, for example, um, there are a couple of live blog posts, but some of these other ones are I just call them material cultural stories because basically they are just um, uh, the same information that's found elsewhere because these are just placeholders at the moment. Go to the next tab page here. This is my about page. It's both about myself and a little bit more information about the project. The database itself here, this page, this is the, the kind of the cream of the crop here of where I'm putting all my information as to what I wanna be thinking about. So you can click on this link, it'll take you right back to where we just were. 
I have broken things up into different categories by material culture, locations, themes, and time periods. So all of this is where I am just using to sort of see how I'm gonna to wanna to organize the longer database. The women tab here. At the moment, this only has a, a few people. Um, there are many more in that map that I showed you, but for the moment, this is where I'm at with this and it's alphabetical order, you click on that and it takes you down to more information about the woman, um, not just her name, her date of birth, where she's from and what she's known for. Um, and then there's just a little bit more information about her there. Under the media page tab, uh, there we go. Um, at the moment, this is just my personal Instagram, but um, I probably will be starting an Instagram for the project long-term different video documentation. Again, this is a place where I am just putting my fieldwork uh, observations into this blog so that I can be thinking about how I'm gonna wanna transfer this information into the larger database for the dissertation. So this is just, these are just uh, placeholders. Contact and contribute. This is where you can get in touch with me. And also the form here, which is uh, another component of all of this is if people have stories themselves they wanna contribute. Maybe they have a family member from you know, years back that has an object that they think is worthy of being incorporated into this database. They can submit it here. And then I also will be starting a monthly newsletter. So this is the blog and there's also other contact information there. All right. This slide right here, just I want to just uh, break down a few key points of the differences between the database and the blog. The database is the larger culmination of the PhD dissertation. It's a public archive, but of past women's material cultures, histories, and overlooked stories. It is uh, open to the public for crowdsourcing. There's going to be lots of media used, including audio narratives, and it's to document and present factual evidence. The blog is just one element of that larger database. And it also is a public archive, but of recent self-reflective autoethnographies um, of the research process done by one person as a testing ground for ideas. There will be also various forms of media, but they're gonna capture my personal observations and opinions. Both of which are, of these are born digital and they transform into intangible material culture once converted into visible symbols. They're also gonna be adapted and edited over time as my research expands. The interface to the deep digital archeological and media databases do not simplify the data, but rather encourage and articulate vectors that can be combined and recombined into meaningful journeys. In this respect, the journeys are database narratives or digital stories that are multivocal, open-ended, and are based on the efforts and ideas of all who have contributed and interacted before. I include this partially because Ruth and Michael, shameless plugs, were my undergraduate thesis advisors. The ways that intangible material culture can weave database narratives into formal scholarship in the larger world are endless. For example, I plan to turn the audio narratives on the database into short films, not reenactments, but as visual expansions on the stories. I am also currently in development with the producer to reshape the women's narratives into a podcast. All of these intangible digital applications will not only act as maps on my research journey, they will also guide me on my quest to rectify our understanding of women in the global historical culture. Thank you. Hello, my name is Claudia Eskew, and thank you for coming to the symposium today. Today, I'm going to talk about how GIS has facilitated my ongoing archaeological research on small scale subsistence taro farming and food sovereignty in a rural to Austral Islands, French Polynesia. Taro is a root crop, it's similar to a yam. It can be seen in the far right image on this uh, slide. 
And the most productive way it can be grown is in irrigated taro fields, which are the center and left images. So the broader goal of my project is to explore how Ruritu's modern taro terraces can illustrate pre-European contact, pollination subsistence, and inform modern decision-making with regards to food sovereignty in Oceania and beyond. If like most people, you've never heard of Ruritu, you go to Tahiti and you take a left and you go south for 350 miles. Um, Ruritu is in the Austral Islands on the outskirts of East Polynesia. And geospatial analysis has played a vital role in continuing my research in remote Oceania through the pandemic. As islanders across Polynesia have to move away from outsider tourist-based economies, sustainable small-scale farming has become a preeminent concern of small and remote island communities. The broader significance of my research will become increasingly relevant as we reevaluate sustainable subsistence practices and food sovereignty at a global scale, especially in the wake of COVID-19 and ongoing climate change pressures. This photo is of a flood event in the Marshall Islands that was caused by climate change. So now I'm gonna go into a little bit of background on Polynesian agriculture. Polynesian agriculture can be divided into two sets of techniques, the wet and the dry. For the purposes of this presentation, it's most important to understand that irrigated taro is significantly more productive than dry land tar agriculture. An immense amount of labor would have been required to construct wetland terrace systems as well as for their ongoing maintenance. As such, taro terracing systems are significant in Polynesia because they have been linked to population increase intense labor investment, and the development of social complexity and social equality. My research builds off of Patrick Kirch's wet versus dry hypothesis, where he asserts Polynesian communities in leeward areas relied on rain-fed dry land farming, while those in windward areas subsisted on irrigated wetland agriculture. Windward communities developed into complex stratified chiefdoms that designated land ownership, control of complex irrigation structures, and agricultural surplus to a divine ruler, chief, or group of elites. The hypothesis also states that leeward communities were unable to produce a surplus through dry land cultivation and developed expansionist chiefdoms where warfare over limited resources was ubiquitous. This image is of dry land taro, which is less productive than wetland taro. My project broadly speaks to modern food sovereignty efforts. Food sovereignty is defined as the right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and the right to define their own food and agricultural systems. Food security is related to food sovereignty in that communities that lack food sovereignty or food security depend in some way on other groups for subsistence resources. Though not linked to colonial processes described in issues of food sovereignty, food security has a long history in Ruritu and other Polynesian islands. And this image is of poi, which is um, a traditional Polynesian food. So Ruritu is in the Austral Islands, which are a generally an understudied area of Polynesian archaeology. Ruritu also has extremely limited internet access which created an extra challenge for anthropological research. And Ruritu is also an ideal location for diachronic research because its taro terraces have been used continuously for a 1000 year sequence. My research poses three main questions. The first is Dutch Kirch's wet versus dry model hold true for Ruritu and how has the landscape impacted Ruritu's history? This image is of Makatea, which are large cliffs that cover almost 30% of Ruritu's small landmass. The second question I'm going to ask is, what was the population of pre-contact Ruritu? And how is Ruritu's population distribute, distributed? How is pre-contact food insecurity in Ruritu relate to modern food sovereignty issues in Oceania and beyond?
To answer these questions, I first located dormant taro terraces on the island. Dormant terraces are terraces that are no longer in use by modern farmers. I identified four environmental and geographic features that constrain arable taro land. The first is perennial streams, which are considered a primary limiting factor. A continuous source of water is vital for successful wetland taro cultivation. Second, previous archeological and arch uh, agricultural research on taro cultivation throughout Polynesia suggests that topographic slope is a major limiting factor in identifying the location of dormant taro complexes. A digital elevation model shows that Ruritu's modern taro fields are entirely in areas with a slope between zero and seven degrees. Third, proximity to village sites strengthens rationale for dormant systems. Ruritu's modern taro complexes are all located directly adjacent to habitation areas. Dormant taro systems would likely also have corresponding habitation sites where farmers would have resided. The last factor I considered was openings in the reef large enough for double hold voyaging canoes as they were a valuable resource to pre-contact Ruritu in population. Districts with large reef openings controlled intra-island trade of a variety of resources not available on Ruritu, such as high quality stone for ads production. You can see one of these large reef openings in the image on the right. Next, I'm gonna briefly go over some of the ethnological and archeological data that I used in conjunction with my geospatial analysis. Oral traditions collected by an ethnographer in the 1930s describe an ongoing conflict between two socio-political districts. Warfare between Windward Pava and Leeward Vitaria, identified in the figure, was the common element of pre-contact Ruritu or two as food insecure Vitaria struggled to feed its sizable population. However, warfare was not the only means by which Vitarian chiefs secured Taro from Pava. Vitaria also traded for food, which suggests leeward communities were not predestined to warfare over resources. Oral traditions demonstrate leeward communities had agency and responded creatively to environmental constraints. Previous archeological survey and excavation also provide data relevant to locating dormant taro fields. Two previous studies provide island-wide maps dating from the late 1960s and early 2000s that detail the locations of archeological village sites and swamp land suitable for taro cultivation. As I've previously discussed, archeological village sites were used to provide supporting rationale for dormant field locations determined primarily with geospatial data. The most fruitful integration of archeological data can be seen in these images. I determined a road in an ideal location for taro cultivation was built after the 1960s, and thus the area was likely used for taro cultivation in the past. Combined geospatial analysis, oral traditions, and archaeological data predicts the most probable locations for Brewer II's dormant taro complexes and can be seen in this image. Oral traditions mainly provide negative data for Vitaria's lack of taro systems that can be seen in the top insert. The red polygons on the right image are the 13 potential areas I located for dormant taro complexes. Next, I performed an in-depth analysis of Ruritu's modern taro complexes using GIS to determine probable annual yields. Satellite imagery of taro complexes from June of 2016 provided the most recent images of Ruritu's wetland agricultural systems with the least cloud coverage. Each taro plot was mapped and characterized by plot area, the corresponding system it belonged to, and whether or not the field was in fallow. Then I determined R values or rates of actively growing fields. Actively growing fields are the green polygons in the insert and the brown polygons are the ones that are in fallow. My analysis reveals a 12% difference between Ruritu's highest and lowest R values, suggest, suggesting equivalently sized taro complexes 
in different districts produced different annual yields. Our values for specific systems provide many benefits for this project, but most significantly, they provide greater accuracy when analyzing River 2's pre-contact probable yields than a standard island-wide R value. Next, I derived annual yields using a formula in my pre ugh, using a formula from previous archaeological research in the region and my location-specific R values. I used probable annual yields as proxy data to predict pre-European contact population. In order to validate my formula for annual yields, it was first used to model modern Ruritun populations and compare my results with the most recent census information. My method estimated the modern Ruritun population at roughly 2,350 people, which deviated only slightly from the 2017 census at 2,466 people. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that this formula can similarly provide a valid population estimate for pre-contact Ruru 2. One roadblock in population estimation was determining what percentage of the pre-contact Ruru 2 in caloric intake came from taro, but I believe 80% of a 3,000 calorie per day diet is the most accurate based on previous dietary studies in the region. So if you can imagine eating 23 taro or roughly 23 potatoes every day, that would be 80% of your diet. Um, fortunately, pre-contact routines were very active and not just sitting around binging Netflix, so they were able to main maintain this diet. Um, in sum, I predict pre-European contact Ruritu had an island-wide population of 2,300 to 3,000 people. Next, I use GIS to analyze the population distribution. The far left image is of the system scale, and this model suggests that the highest populations of, from Taro and the highest yields came from systems in Pava and Paparai, with smaller populations supported throughout the island. The center image is of the district scale, um, where the largest populations likely resided in Pava, while the other districts had more modest populations. And the right image is of the windward versus leeward scale. As expected per Kirch's wet versus dry hypothesis, tar complexes on the windward side of the island appear to have supported a much larger population than the leeward side. Higher R values and widespread field abandonment suggest the windward side once supported a population more than three times the size of the leeward side. I identified two main sources of error with regard to my population distribution models. First, modern construction creates faulty slip data for the digital elevation model for several areas throughout Ruru 2. Most notably, the airstrip in Una'a really erased any geospatial evidence of dormant tarot complexes. Second, as evidenced in Ruru 2 and oral traditions, previous archaeological research and geospatial analysis, Vitaria's lack of perennial streams and prominent cliffs prevented the district from cultivating taro. As my population distribution model assumes population as a function of probable annual yields of taro, it excludes Vitarian wetland, dry land, sorry, dry land subsistence strategies and rating driven by food insecurity. Um, in conclusion, my research supports Kirch's wet versus dry hypothesis. My model shows two main points with regards to food security. The first is that environmental constraints that influence food production and carrying capacity do not determine how humans navigate food security. My research confirms food preference is a key factor in food security as Vitaria did not fully shift their subsistence strategies to dry land cultivation. Archaeological research on food security suggests successful modern food sovereignty efforts must be adaptive. My model shows Ruru 2 and Tara farmers may have responded proactively to population loss in the colonial period by consolidating their efforts to support a much smaller population. Additionally, Tara field reduction may show shifts in diet towards tree crops that are less labor intensive to maintain than irrigated taro. Although Ruru 2 provides useful 
model, a useful model for other communities seeking food sovereignty. Modern food sovereignty efforts must be context specific. My research demonstrates a holistic approach to evaluating food security that considers environmental, political, economic, and social factors. Future research is required to ground truth GIS analysis of dormant fields and to investigate environmental factors and social structures that maintain small scale sustainable farming in Peru. Thank you. I look forward to hearing your, your questions um, in the panel. Okie dokie. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Talley, and I am one of the co-founders of Design in Quarantine. Um, it is an online archive which collects real-time design responses to the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the subject of my presentation today. Um, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking the time out of your Saturday to come listen to all of the exciting presentations we have as part of the symposium and to um, CMS MC for hosting. Fleur, my co-founder, was an, an, unable to make it to the conference today, but she is here in spirit. Um, and should you want to reach out to her, um, her contact information will be available on the final slide. Uh, okay. So um, at the time, we were both MA History of Design and Material Culture students at the VNA Royal College of Art in London. Um, Fleur specializes in medieval Europe and its interactions with the Islamic world, focusing on technology, performance, and nature. And my work focuses on the history of modern and contemporary design, particularly graphics and communication, um, which complemented each other very well because we're sort of on you know, opposite ends of um, the historical spectrum. Um, and, but we both had a shared interest in the digital humanities, which Fleur in particular had cultivated during a term exchange at the Bard Graduate Center in New York. Um, our, a pro, our MA program also has a focus on design history as public practice and actively cultivates an interest in public facing research. Out of this environment and with the pandemic causing the closure of museums and libraries, forcing a shift upon traditional research methodologies, Design in Quarantine was born. Um, so we began talking about the project just after the UK went into lockdown. Um, these are some of Fleur's very scribbled shorthand notes of our very first chat on the 6th of April 2020. We were wondering how we could respond as historians to something that was happening in the present. Um, and after discussion, we thought the best way would be with a rapid response archive. So within two weeks of having talked over our initial ideas, we decided on a name, secured the web domain, worked out a design for the website and launched. And we felt that it was important to have the archive live as soon as possible due to the volume of work that was being covered in the press and what we saw in our own social media feeds. So we drew on several theories of archiving to form our methodology and were particularly inspired by Elizabeth Gale's essay, The History of Archives State of the Discipline. We also took from Foucault's definition of archiving, which considers the entire underlying foundational system in the creation of histories and discourses as the archive. And Foucault's broader definition allowed us to prod at some of the issues surrounding what we would typically consider as a static and solid documentary archive, particularly as design and quarantine was constructed in real time alongside the discourses that will form the historical foundation of the pandemic. Uh, so using the technique of what historian Kirsten Weld calls thinking archivally, we approach design and quarantine critically through the questions. What does it mean to start a digital archive? How do historians respond to contemporary crises? Um, and we are particularly interested in archiving as a response to periods of significant historical importance or change. And this is something we've put into practice with design and quarantine. Um, how can we make living history as accessible as possible using digital methodologies? And how can we provide a platform for designers, both now and in the future, to educate themselves on the ways in which design can respond to a public health crisis? So we quickly drew up our initial rationale, outcomes, and collections manifesto. Um, and the core of our purpose was in the rationale, which stated, we hope that this living archive will serve as an inspiration to designers looking to change the course of the pandemic through design-based initiatives. It will also serve as a record of how the field of design responded, simultaneously highlighting a shift in design historical practice and creating a resource for future generations. Um, these are the working spaces that we had um, when we did this project, and we did not physically see each other throughout the entire creation of the archive. All communication was done through Google Drive, WhatsApp, and Zoom. 
Um, I was based in London and Fleur was based in Kent. And it wasn't actually until August when we finally met again in person. Um, and we still find it sort of surreal that we were able to do the entire project digitally. Um, our methods have made us reflect on both the benefits and challenges of researching and working purely on digital platforms. Um, and it's something we hope historians more widely will take the time to reflect on as the pandemic continues to shape the field. We also developed a digital toolkit to help us promote our platform to the public. This included our hosting platform, Cargo, our social media scheduler, Later, our ever trusty email inbox, um, and Canva and Photoshop, which helped us create um, assets, visual assets. We figured out Creative Commons licensing too, um, which enabled us to use certain images on our platform and set up a submission form um, for works to be sent to us. Um, based on the technique of rapid response curation, which we have firsthand knowledge of being based at the VNA, our archive is constantly um, growing and evolving. Our aim was to collect a range of responses across design disciplines, including but not limited to graphics, architectural concepts, product and furniture design, and bespoke craft. Um, this means there's a lot of stuff to archive. Um, therefore, it was important for us to make the website as simple to navigate in as objective as possible um, due to the volume of things that we were collecting. Um, one of the questions we asked ourselves when designing the navigation of the site was how can we create taxon taxonomies beyond type um, and make large and, and how can we make large claims about works when the event is still unfolding around us? Um, and in an attempt to combat, combat implicit biases and consciously reject taxonomic hierarchies, we designed the website to randomize the entries displayed on the homepage each time an individual visits. Um, we also restricted sorting the entries into six very broad categories, providing only a base level of organization. This randomization and looseness in our site can be seen to reflect the chaos of the world as it came to grips with the pandemic. Um, as the magazine Icon described us, quote, a disorderly archive is perhaps the sincerest record of our history. Um, the language of our labels is also clear and as close to museum quality as possible, and we wanted simple, helpful information rather than sort of complex opinions or analyses. Um, we'd also um, be interested to display labels in multiple languages and alphabets if submitted in that format. We're pretty much open to anything. Um, and we are very lucky and very flattered to begin receiving press interest fairly soon after the launch of the website. Um, we were in the New York Times, Icon, Desenio, the Financial Times, um, in the V&A's Pandemic Object Series, among others. Um, an interest in the archive in these more general and practice-based press outlets demonstrated the achievement of one of our aims, which was to reach beyond the design historical community with the archive and bring the project and the work within to a larger public. Um, moving beyond design media outlets like Dezine or Design Boom, we began to look at a variety of sources such as international newspapers to find examples of responses that we can include in the archive. Um, and this helped to diversify the content of the archive um, of what would typically be featured in design media. Um, we also began to actively outreach for submissions on social media, which led us to become more engaged with our, engaged with our audience and think more proactively about our collection process. Um, the archive is still open for submissions, and we have received a number of designs from individuals, firms, and studios from all over the world. Um, our frequent presence on social media illustrates how we encourage wider exposure for the projects we collect, seeking feedback and suggestions from the communities um, which are on these different platforms. Um, at first, we simply copied over the label um, from our site uh, to our social media captions for each piece. Um, but we've recently switched to asking questions of our audiences to further engagement. Um, our social presence online demonstrates an inherently open methodology for design research from our use of non-academic platforms to create an open source archive to accepting all varieties of design responses. It also underscores the importance we give to only using free platforms for the public and research community to interact with the material. Um, we've also started a successful online newsletter, which has been running since January 2021, to continue this public outreach by providing updates about the archive and COVID-related design more broadly. Um, the newsletter also serves as a way um, for us to reflect on our work through short essays, um, and you can head to designingquarantine.com slash news to find all of our newsletters, and we are also open to um, guest essays, so should you be interested in writing something about the pandemic and design, um, please get in touch. 
So again, on the subject of outreach, um, we also wanted to explore our project's impact beyond the repository itself. So we recently headed a three-day workshop at the Royal College of Art titled the Alt Archive Alternative Archiving Workshop, which we ran with students as part of Across RCA 2021. Um, the workshop aimed to break away from traditional modes and concepts of archiving, exposing students to new ideas about collecting and preserving the material and immaterial. Um, we wanted to produce a workshop based on the methodologies we had been using as historians and archivists slash collectors, and also to unpick and respond to archiving as a practice. Um, and the aim wasn't for us to put our project center stage, but to collaboratively discuss and observe how participants responded to different methods of archiving, different prompts and different opinions. Um, and we had some pretty incredible responses from fellow students, which you can see here on these slides. Um, so uh, a couple of these were created in response to uh, a prompt to kind of create your own archive with the things that you know were around you. Um, so we have these sort of everyday objects that were really lovely photographed. Um, by Johann Spindler, um, these um, postcards, which are really fun. Um, and Paulina um, managed to create a online archive for material relating to the Russia protests, um, which you can visit at russiaprotest.org. Um, and here is um, another piece by Saba. Uh, this was in response to the prompt to create a your own manifesto about archiving. Um, so she designed these two um, pieces here with, with her personal manifesto of archiving based off of um, what we had discussed in the workshop. Um, and on this point as well, we would like to thank our program heads, Sarah Chang and James Ryan, for being so supportive throughout the project. Our MA course not only exposed us to ideas like rapid response collecting through its placement within the VNA, but also contains a course module called History as Public Practice, which encourages students to think about the creation and dissemination of scholarly research outside of the academy. Although we created DIQ independently of the course itself, we were heavily inspired by the ideas History as Public Practice instilled in us as students, and the module or something like it is something we hope to see become incorporated across MA courses, particularly in light of the growing demand that public institutions like museums are held more accountable by the publics that they serve. Um, we knew that the pandemic period and the designs it generated would be of interest to future design researchers, hence the idea of constructing a simple digital archive that could serve as a resource. Um, but also the digital afterlives of collections in our now very virtual world was something which concerned us, um, as so many websites seem so ephemeral. So we made sure that our site was saved on the Wayback Machine and applied for it to be archived by the UK Web Archive, which it now is. Um, so it is available on site in the Bodleian Libraries at Oxford, the Cambridge University Libraries, Trinity College Dublin, the National Libraries of Scotland, and the British Library in perpetuity. Um, the Design History Society's Virtual Student Award had also helped us to secure another year's worth of hosting, um, and we would be very interested in further collaboration on digital preservation, so please do reach out if that would be of interest. I just got an email this morning with the JSON text output of our entire site, um, so we're really looking for um, collaborators to help us with, you know, further analyzing the data and um, archiving the site. Um, so since the project's launch in April, we have collected over 450 works we believe are integral to representing the evolution and variety of design responses to the coronavirus pandemic. Collected, conceptualized, and living in the now, the digital archive will continue to function beyond the end of the pandemic when used as a research resource in the future. It engages socially, culturally, intellectually, and intellectually with relevant research questions for both practitioners and historians in the design community during the global pandemic. Um, and we believe our public archive holds the inspiration to answer many of the most pressing questions in the realms of public health, the, env the environment, work, and society. Um, and seeking ways to collaborate, we're always interested to work with fellow historians or researchers or practitioners to foster research across all four of these areas. Um, we really aim to show that history is not always in the past, um, that it is happening now, and that designing quarantine can be part of the evolving story of COVID-19 now and in the future. Um, and we would invite you to be a part of the story by submitting to the archive yourself. You can submit any project from any point in the pandemic, either something you've made yourself or something you found. Um, if you go to the submit page on our site and fill out the simple submission form, um, it'll send straight to our email, our email inbox um, for us to review. Um, and you too can be a part of our research resource for future designers and practitioners. Um, lastly, I look forward to answering any questions you might have. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. Um, to listen to this presentation. Thank you so much.
Uh, hey all, uh, super excited to talk today. My name is Kale Avery and I'm gonna be talk talking about uh, digital material culture. Specifically, I'm gonna be talking about material culture as it is embedded in video games. My goal with this presentation is to illustrate some of the ways historic material culture comes to be used by digital artists and to help find answers to broader questions about making and consuming in the 21st century. My hope is that you leave this presentation with an appreciation for the important work going on in a new and highly experimental medium, that being video games, and that you start to look at digital objects um, and artifacts in your own life in perhaps a new way. So. Bioshock uh, was developed by Irrational Games and published in 2007. Um, and it's the subject of my research for a number of reasons. For one, it was critically acclaimed and widely popular when it came out. Um, and it was lauded by critics as an important place where artfulness within the medium was really questioned, um, ascertained and kind of affirmed. Um, and it's been um, uh, an important place uh, for scholars to talk about games in general as a sort of crossroads. People have covered different aspects from queer performativity to ludonarrative dissonance to just about anything you could imagine specifically um, relating to this game. So the game itself, it's set in the year 1960 in a city at the bottom of the sea, um, a failed utopia with a distinctly early to mid 20th century aesthetic, um, aesthetic known as Rapture. Thematically, the game explored um, sort of the consequences of unchecked capitalistic growth within an isolated society, specifically dealing with Ayn Rand's objectivist philosophy. So why is somebody doing material culture studies studying video games? Um, something that seems so paradoxically related to materiality. Well, for one, um, we're all conducting, a lot of us, uh, master's theses uh, in a difficult uh, time, right? Especially during the pandemic. And it helped that my central archive was just a few clicks away. Um, and really what it did, the pandemic offered me the opportunity to start answering questions that I think were really critical to this moment of time and to the future. But um, uh, kind of a broader answer to that question, um, the Electronic Software Association in 2018 uh, published a statistic that 50% of adults in America were playing games for just more or for more than just an hour a week. Now, just this last July, so that'd be during uh, the pandemic, that number was updated to show that 75% of, of adults in America were playing games for more than an hour a week. It's no secret that video games are becoming an increasingly critical feature in our entertainment landscape. Um, and, and more important than that, we need to understand that people are starting to experience material culture primarily through this medium. Um, in terms of actually being able to look at stuff closely, uh, uh, handle stuff, move stuff around um, and get a better sense of it. So I, uh, uh, <clears throat> moving on from that, uh, um, so you might be wondering what I'm saying when I say uh, digital object. Digital object to me refers to any sort of object, ephemera, or piece of architecture that sort of occupies um, a game environment. I'm gonna be clicking through an, a few images from the game Bioshock. And I wanna stress that my, game, my, my thesis research is primarily concerned with the set dressing and detritus of Bioshock. Um, that being the objects that populate the background rather than what uh, the player character is exactly using. Um, the game is stuffed to the absolute brim with digital objects and each were placed carefully and made by the hands of an artist. So I wanted to set out exploring kind of what these objects are, how they're made, and what sort of things they're composed of. Um, and the current research uh, kind of on this subject uh, in gaming studies is known as archaeo gaming. Um, I would say that gaming studies has just now begun contending with the materiality of the medium. And this, uh, here, one sec. Oh, my bad. Uh, all right, sorry. <laughs> Presenting in this format is so wild to me. I'm doing my best here. Uh, okay, so um, one of the defining texts for Archeo Gaming, it is like, it's it's brand new. This thing came out in 2018 by Andrew Reinhardt and it proposes a number of avenues for studying video games. Um, and a few of those avenues we're just gonna have to take as true assertions to get to where I wanna go with it. And that is that a video game is an object containing other objects 
And that um, the game environment, game environments like, you know, in the city of Rapture, as you're playing this game, qualify as built environments and can be studied as such. Now, included inside of that definition is the fact that these built environments contain a distinctive uh, sort of material culture. Um, video games were made uh, by humans, and although their environments and objects um, that are contained within are non-physical and highly curated, they still exist and still were made by a number of human hands. And as such can be studied um, from a material culture perspective. So far, um, this field is yet to be fully described. And so I really wanted to add a little bit more clarity um, to the material culture side of this, the discussion by considering contemporary um, postmodern, or by, by considering it through the lens of contemporary postmodern philosophy, um, specifically postmodern philosophy that contends with consuming and making in the 21st century. Uh, specifically, I consulted the work of contemporary uh, Japanese philosopher, uh, Hiroki Azuma. Um, who wrote a book uh, titled, um, sorry, who wrote a book titled um, uh, J Otaku, Japan's Database Animals in 2001. In that book, Azuma proposed three main concepts. Um, the f and, and first was expanding upon um, the concept of simulacra, which was first described by Baudrillard. Um, these are really complex um, objects, kind of a subcategory of object. Um, and that said, I'm going to describe just one aspect of it, and that is that objects made by artists, corporations, and consumers kind of become undifferentiable by the average person. They start to exist on the same plane. Um, the idea is that, is, uh, is that these things... Um, are all made using sort of the same methods, tools, um, means, you know, labor practices. And so they become hard to discern. Um, there, of course, are ranges in quality, and that's important to note. Um, but the theory of simulacra, the concept of simulacra, becomes especially evident in digital spaces where anybody can make memes, anybody can riff on different concepts. Um, and I think that's a really easy way to sort of understand it. Uh, the second concept that Azuma proposed was um, the Mo element. And Mo element refers to a singular visual motif or component part of an object that can be taken, like removed from an object and combined with other elements from other objects to create entirely new objects. Um, from here forward, I'm going to be using the term Mo element and visual element sort of interchangeably, so keep that in mind. Um, the third concept that Azuma proposed is this idea of the database. And that is sort of the underlying logic that connects Mo elements together. Azuma used these concepts um, to explain popular practices in making in Japanese anime and manga, but I believe that as a conceptual tool, they can have a much broader significance and can be applied to the studying of material culture in games um, and also digital objects in general, but the subject of my, of my research was specifically looking at how this sort of played out in the realm of games um, and also how it worked with um, history as a sort of database. So. Um, I'm arguing um, through this thesis that with a heightened access to the material culture of the world, the artists of Bioshock and their fans, um, which is sort of a critical aspect of this, participated fully in a postmodern act of creation and consumption. They treated history like a database from which they harnessed visual elements to combine and recombine to create an entirely new objects. Their simulacra were neither wholly original nor entirely derivative, but note noteworthy for their relationship to making today, um, contemporary making in general. I'm also contending that a significant portion of the actual materiality of, this, of these objects is the fact that they're composite in nature. It's the elements that went into composing them. Um, so these are some fairly heady concepts that I end up elucidating on more in my thesis. But for the next few slides, I'm gonna share with you guys um, a few of uh, these sort of objects that illustrate kind of what I'm talking about. Um, so here we have a theater front. Um, we see our first collection of historically inspired digital objects. This is Fleet Hall, which is a theater in the entertainment district of Rapture. The artists of Bioshock consulted a number of reference images. Um, specifically, they often used 
academic reference books, um, coffee table art books, um, and especially used uh, Google images. Now, they did have an artist by the name of Mauricio Tidrina, uh, who traveled to New York City to take a couple of photographs, um, which were then used to sort of inform this process. Um, and from all of this aggregate of images, this, this, this database, um, a formal database on their end of images, they pulled and combined a number of elements to create this scene. So the lettering we see here was taken directly from Radio City Music Hall in New York City, which was built in 1933. Um, and the neon sign has become instantly recognizable as a piece of, uh, of early 20th century architecture. Now, the decorative elements of the marquee, that actually was pulled from a uh, uh, sort of a, a renovated um, Hollywood theater uh, marquee, which was made in 1938. So throughout the game, the artists used Futura font um, family extensively, which was designed by Paul Renner in 1927. And it was intended to sort of articulate efficiency um, and speed and be easy to read from long distances. Uh, lastly, these little statues at the, stop, at the top of the stairs so I, as a part of this project, I interviewed a bunch of artists um, who worked on the game. And they actually uh, told me that, that for this object, they used um, uh, Oscar J.W. Hanson's Winged Figures of the Republic, which if you're not familiar, this is the statue um, right at the base of the Hoover Dam. And they also used Nina St. Anderson's Spirit of Achievement, which is uh, actually at the top of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. Um, now, there are these, these particular objects are featured in hundreds of locations around the game, and they sort of rift on different aspects of them, um, giving them wings on occasion, elongating them, sort of flattening them in some occasions. And in this digital space, you can really manipulate a lot um, as far as scale is concerned. Um, so the next, uh, the next object I'm going to be talking about comes from the game's farmer's market. Um, which features several really complex posters, which we're going to focus on one in particular. This is an example of a composite object at its most obvious. So the advertisement was actually taken from a fictional produce, or as the, the advertisement is for a, a fictional produce bear brand in the city of Rapture, but the image of the girl actually comes from a brand of oranges known as Sunbeam which was produced sometime in the 1940s. Um, as you can see here, the artist changed the shirt to pink and sort of inverted the image. Now the lemon motif actually comes from leader brand lemons, which was produced sometime around the turn of the century. And both of these images were actually pulled directly from fruit crate labels. Um, uh, and they fell out of copyright in the 1960s and entered public domain. Again, we see here the use of font, the Futura font family, which, um, uh, you know, like I said, is indicative of the period, but you know, we also see Broadway font, which stereotypically is also associated with the period, which was designed by Morris Fuller Benton in, in uh, 1928. So lastly, we see here the uh, uh, day poster font, which was de developed by Nick Curtis in 2002. Interestingly, the font was actually designed after a prominent uh, vinyl lettering style from the 1930s to 1950s, uh, first designed by the Chicago Cling Tight Lettering Co. So with my next slide, I'm going to briefly illustrate a work of graphic design made by one of the game's fans. Um, this is interesting because it was um, a photographer living in um, Atlanta, Georgia, um, that wanted to see more depictions of Black people in their favorite game, which was Bioshock. So the artist set about uh, using the same methods to um, create uh, the same methods and materials to create a, a poster for a musician of their own invention. Um, he ended up using an image um, produced by a telebrand oranges with a similar compositional uh, framework. You can see here he changed the mustache, removed a ring, and changed the clothes um, to a collared shirt. Um, in this way, both artists and fans deconstructed historic images and refashioned them into their own sort of simulacra. So, this is my final example. Um, here we see a refrigerator in a section of the game known as Olympus Heights, which is sort of like the fancy swanky section of Rapture. And it has a shiny cherry red finish um, with gold accents and an ionic column at its center. Now, the fridge was actually modeled after the P uh, or the B, P, B, and J, B line of General Electric refrigerator cabinet, um, which was popular from the late 1930s well into the 1950s. For the most part, they kept the fridge um, mostly the same, but they did sort of change some things that sort of obfuscated the meaning of this object in the long run. We see that um, 
for example, the characteristic column um, was sort of elongated. It was, they added an additional ridge to it. Um, they removed the nameplate and replaced it with some sort of general trapezoidal sort of shape. And the grill at the bottom, they actually extended around the circumference of the entire fridge base, sort of defeating the purpose of the grill in general in an interesting way. Um, now, we see the, the fridge again um, as an article of simulacra twice removed. Um, in 2020, a fan and digital artist by the name of Benoit Chimon uh, discovered the fridge while playing the game during the pandemic and in his words, immediately fell in love. He set about re reproducing the fridge in his own style with no knowledge of his historic antecedents. Um, and we can see that the fridge has become even more obfuscated from the general electric fridge by several degrees. Um, they changed the primary material of the cabinet of the fridge from porcelain to a rust metal with blistering red paint. Um, and they also extended the grill on the bottom into a sort of base or stand, um, completely removing it from the concept of the grill that, you know, was sort of a part of the original design. Um, so while the object in Bioshock was not a direct copy of the General Electric fridge, it was close. It was a near direct copy. Um, and thus, it wasn't necessarily a composite digital object. When you actually place this fridge in the built environment of Bioshock and surround it by other historically inspired works, the object actually does become a singular visual element comprising a greater comp or a greater comp or, sorry, a greater composite digital object, that being the video game Bioshock. So my goal with this project is to challenge um, some of our concepts of materiality by pointing out the material qualities and origins of uh, digital objects. I would also like to propose through this thing a methodological framework for examining the creation of digital objects um, through a postmodern lens. And I hope uh, in some way I've demonstrated um, that these abstracted video game objects do possess um, qualities um, that a material culture research should find interesting and worthy of study. The thing is, is people playing games today are some of the people interacting with historic material culture the most through these objects. Um, their importance has not been lost on video game artists or fans, but they're not experiencing them, them in the ways that we're sort of used to um, in this industry. And I think that we need to be doing some readjusting with how we orient ourselves to this audience um, and how we work with the artists of these games to try and produce either A, more accurate objects or B, provide them with things that they can use um, to create better or more interesting composites. Um, so my contact information is as attached. Uh, thanks so much for coming. I'm really excited to talk with you all during the panel. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me today at the CMSMC conference. And thank you to all the panelists who presented before me. It's super exciting to hear about all of your projects so far. So today my presentation is called I Want Truth, Best Practices for Creating an Online Exhibit. So who is this kid who's presenting to you today? My name is Abigail Eplett. I am uh, getting my master's degree in museum education and will be graduating this May in 2021. My two main academic areas of interest are the early 19th century in New England and digital technology in museums. Additionally, I am a volunteer in parks or VIP for the National Park Service at the Blackstone River Valley. Um, this project came out of a combination of my interests. I started working on this digital exhibition in the summer of 2021, uh, sorry, the summer of 2020 in collaboration of the National Park Service. Um, this was to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave American women the right to vote in federal elections. This was a born digital online exhibit called Abby Kelly Foster, Freedom, Faith, and Family, uh, commemorating the life of a local human rights activist. I was inspired by one of Abby Kelly's many quotes, harmony. I don't want harmony, I want truth. Um, so often in the past, museums have stuck to doing things 
uh, just because that's how they have always done it. Uh, the staff wants to maintain harmony with their board, with their current museum members, with their regular visitors. Uh, however, when museums play it safe, uh, they miss out on the chance to bring truth to a wider audience, uh, whether they are sharing resources with researchers around the world or engaging with different demographics than would typically go to museums. Uh, so how are we going to change that? Um, first of all, uh, museums need to make their artifacts more accessible. Sorry, I skipped a slide. Museums need to make their artifacts more accessible to researchers. Uh, they must be uh, more diligent when curating digital artifacts or digital born exhibits. And finally, uh, they must make these exhibits accessible to the widest range of people possible. Uh, this information needs to be, uh, the information for these exhibits are already available online. So I'm going to start by talking about conducting preliminary research, and this includes navigating digital collection systems and our current rules of reproduction. You prob probably already know of the many research resources that exist online. This might include archives. I break these down into two types. Some of these archives were originally physical, um, and some of these archives were born digital. You've already seen a few of these digital born archives today. Libraries, of course, are a great resource, especially with the proliferation of ebooks and online material, as are online journals like our best friend, JSTOR. There are pros and cons to our current system of online research. For pros, these databases have huge potential. They can be accessed from any time, anywhere, as long as you have internet. And it's super easy to save articles or artifacts for later research. Unfortunately, there are also cons to these current systems. Many databases have poorly built infrastructure. They have no money for maintenance or to be updated. Uh, search bars may not work and it's not keyword friendly. And the rules for reproduction are currently often unclear. I'm going to focus on this final bullet point right now. So what are some solutions for this problem of reproduction and copyright? Uh, the first solution is for databases to try to create clearer terms of reproduction. Websites currently often have permissions pages. I'm going to show you examples from the American Antiquarian Society and from the Boston Public Library because I use a lot of information from these organizations while I was researching for my exhibit. Additionally, um, museums might have to decide what type of copyright or copyright licensing they are going to give their work. For example, work can be placed in the public domain or they can use a Creative Commons license. And additionally, um, educators need to be um, given more advice about how fair use comes into play for using materials. So here is a page from the American Antiquarian Society website, an organization based in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, with plenty of artifacts from the Blackstone River Valley region and also uh, from different parts of Massachusetts and the United States. Uh, you can see here that the society has decided to make all of their material available for free to the public using a Creative Commons license, no permission required, uh, as long as the end user gives a credit line courtesy of the American Antiquarian Society. Um, this was very different from what I found on the Boston Public Library website. They also have a well-worded rights and permissions page but it is much more difficult to figure out how to produce their images. Uh, the library does not hold the copyright to the items in their collection, and therefore they cannot grant or deny permission to use the copies of the item. So it is up to the researcher ultimately to figure out who actually owns the artifacts. One way to avoid copyright issues is of course, using artifacts only found in the public domain. If you're a little bit cynical, as I can be sometimes, uh, you might think that the public domain uh, is a place where artifacts 
uh, finally enter it because they are so old that the government and giant corporations no longer have a use for them. Uh, but there are actually four ways that items enter the public domain. It depends on how old the artifact is, as I mentioned before. Um, it might happen because an owner failed to follow the rules of renewal for their copyright. Uh, it might happen because an owner, owner decides to dedicate their work to the public domain. Or it might be a catchphrase or some other type of work that is cannot be copyrighted. Uh, again, while the public domain is often filled by older articles, uh, it's totally possible for a modern owner to dedicate their work to the public domain if the owner does not care about losing all control of their work. That's where the Creative Commons comes in. There are six levels of Creative Commons licenses from most to least permissible. On the most end, uh, users need to only give credit to the author uh, before editing, remixing, or reproducing the object however they desire. On the least end, users are only allowed to replicate the object exactly as it appears in a non-commercial format and give credit to the author. All of these licenses under the Creative Commons are completely free for reproduction. And I think this is a great opportunity for museums to share digital reproductions of their artifacts, both with other museums, to researchers, and to the general public. And what better way to share these items than in a universal database or archive, which brings together the thousands of digital archives in existence. Uh, for example, here we see the page of the Digital Commonwealth. It's an organization uh, in Massachusetts that allows multiple archives to come together. It still has its copyright woes, however. Uh, currently, the Digital Commonwealth is only responsible pre for presenting the artifacts, not for maintaining consistent copyright systems. Uh, so users still have to track down the original owner. However, uh, should a unified system be required by a single database, uh, it would be an invaluable resource to researchers, museums, and other educators. Moving on to the curation of artifacts, I try to keep the section pretty short and simple. We seem to have a good grasp of what curation is. Um, when you are curating an exhibit or the digital sphere, I find the most important thing to do is use common sense. Think about what can easily be seen on a screen. You aren't able to walk through a space like you can in a museum. Uh, so making sure that things look okay on a screen is the item of most importance. You can't see details on a screen without zooming in. Additionally, written documents can be very difficult to read. You can work around this. Um, by transcribing a document or using a paraphrase explanation. Finally, size of an object can be difficult to convey on a screen. Is the object very large? Is it very small? Often I find using the age old trick of putting a person in the picture to convey the size is a great workaround for this issue. Additionally, in our current state of digital archives, it can be very difficult to find a digital reproduction of the object that you want. Either it is not online yet or it does not exist. For example, when working on my exhibit, I wanted to find a dress or other item of clothing worn by Abby Kelly Foster. However, um, Abby Kelly Foster did not save any of her clothing. She preferred to donate it to people in need. For an equivalent, I used both clothing of Lucretia Mott, a fellow Quaker activist who wore a very similar style of clothing. And I also used photographs of Abby Kelly Foster because these two digital representations um, can be combined together in a visitor's mind. People can get a very good understanding of what an original artifact might have looked like. Now I'm going to talk about the final product, the production of an exhibit. One of my goals as a digital exhibit designer is to make my exhibits accessible to the widest range of visitors. I use standards of accessibility set by the American Alliance of Museums and by the National Park Service to accommodate people uh, with learning differences and disabilities. I also want to reach an audience uh, that's both online and in person. I have created 
versions of the exhibit in a range of digital formats to accommodate different learning styles. And I have also created a physical version of the exhibit that allows the Abby Kelly Foster Project to go wherever the people are. One acronym I always keep in mind while designing is the word IDEA. Um, it's important for your exhibit to be inclusive so everyone feels welcome. Uh, having a diverse history where everyone is represented is especially important for exhibits to be equitable. All voices must be treated with respect and treated fairly. Finally, with all these factors combined together, along with accommodations for different abilities and learning styles, creating an environment uh, where everyone can participate. Uh, the National Park Service takes uh, the IDEA principle very seriously. Um, information must be made available in specific formats. Uh, this is non-negotiable. And this non-negotiable attitude uh, would be very beneficial for other organizations and nonprofits to take up. For example, audio tours must be provided with written tours. Transcripts must be provided along with videos or linked to a video. And for live events, closed captioning and or American Sign Language must be provided. Uh, because of my commitment to IDEA and to the National Park Service regulations, I created the Abby Kelly Foster exhibit in a multiplicity of formats. Uh, it's the same material found in many different types of media. For example, some of this material is accessible online uh, besides using the National Park Service website and social media. I have created material in audiovisual formats from YouTube videos and talks over Zoom, just like this one you're at right now. Of course, text is still a major factor of online communication. Uh, so the exhibit has been repeated in blogs and in online magazines in written only formats. Uh, finally, in an era where social distancing is very important, people still want to go outside um, I have created an exhibit in a pop-up poster format that can be easily moved uh, throughout the region. And I was even able to give out stickers during the 2020 election, um, putting up the posters at a polling station and allowing visitors to spread the word about the Abby Kelly Foster exhibit to different people in their community. So what is my conclusion from all of this? How should we be designing born digital projects in the future? First of all, when conducting preliminary research, online archives are the way of the future. Our, our artifacts can be discovered and shared at any time and in any place uh, with the use of the internet. However, if we want to rely more heavily on these digital archives, there must be more work to improve the infrastructure, facility, um, facilities, uh, inter-organizational collaboration, and improvements occurring in copyright issues. Secondly, when curating digital artifacts, designers need to take that extra moment to make sure that what they reproduce can be properly vi viewed on a screen of any size. Um, also, especially in these early stages of internet archives, it can be very difficult for exhibition designers to find the exact artifact they need. Uh, so designers and curators must be creative in finding digital equivalents to artifacts that have not yet made it online. Finally, when producing an exhibit, Accessibility to the greatest number of people possible is key. And it's important to try to meet people where they are, whether it is on a specific platform online or an opportunity to bring a born digital exhibit into the real world. So thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to answering your many questions, I'm sure, and the Q&A se session. Feel free to contact me via email or shoot me a message on Twitter and enjoy the rest of the symposium. Have a great day. Good morning. Thank you, Abby, and to all of our panelists for their insightful presentations. It is my great honor to introduce today's keynote speaker, Sherry Berger. Currently, Sherry serves as the first digital program officer at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History where she oversees the museum's digital collections team in support of 1.8 million objects and 22,000 square feet of archival material. In 2019, Sherry led the museum to release the entirety of its object records and images to the web, ushering in a new era of transparency at the institution. 
She is currently building workflows for born digital collecting, including a forthcoming project to document American women's history through web archiving. Prior to joining the Smithsonian, Sherry worked at the University of California's California Digital Library, where she helped build user-centered online access to collections contributed to by hundreds of organizations statewide. Sherry holds an MS in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a BA in American Studies from Northwestern University. Please join us in welcoming Sherry. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, give me just a moment to share my screen. All right, I'm, I'm gonna trust that that's working unless someone chats me or, or texts me or emails me otherwise. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I wanna express my gratitude to the symposium organizers for inviting me to present. Um, it, it's been a real pleasure getting to know all of you. Um, and additionally, uh, the, the speakers that preceded me, um, what a wonderful uh, group of panelists to uh, kind of team me up because I think that you will all hear resonances of what all of them have discussed over the course of my uh, little presentation today. And um, as an entry point into all of this, um, I wanted to take just a minute for us to collectively reflect basically on just some of the digital content that has defined our experiences of the past year, right? Because it has been a very rich year for being online um, for a lot of people, not all people, but a lot of people. Um, and I, I'd like to kind of just get us in the headspace of thinking about, you know, what has been more or less our collective story online? What are the digital assets that we could think about that form our experience of 2020 and 2021? Um, starting a little bit light, um, I know that many of you are probably familiar with Animal Crossing. This has been kind of like the darling of quarantine and provided a very fun distraction for many people. Uh, also this year, we had a Democratic National Convention that was entirely virtual, right? Um, we also had an inauguration parade that was the same with a mix of pre-recorded and live content. We have seen the success and also the epic failures, right, of government and private websites to mobilize the public health response to COVID-19. This is a site that was recently rolled out um, to help people find uh, vaccines state by state according to the state policies. Social media, of course, has been a huge part of our lives this past year. This is a graph showing the usage of the Black Lives Matter hashtag on Twitter, starting in January 2013 and all the way up through June of last year. And just note that exponential growth on the right-hand side, right? Um, and I think this graph alone is already, without digging into the particular tweets and the specifics, right? It gives a sense of the relationship between social media and the real world and, and what we experienced last summer and continue to discuss. Um, and finally, I, I couldn't, couldn't do this presentation without throwing in a nod to NFTs or non-fungible tokens, if you have been following this. In the past few months, we have seen the rise of NFTs. Um, and this digital collage image by the artist Beeple actually sold for $70 million at Christie's. So with that as a backdrop, okay, what I wanna talk about today is what it means for memory institutions to collect these kinds of materials. And we already started to hear a glimpse of this in the earlier presentations. Um, you know, we might see giant selfies hanging next to Rembrandt's um, as this cartoon implies, right? And that's very possible. Actually, arguably, Cindy Sherman has doing, been doing that for a long time. Um, but I would argue that the landscape of digital collecting is, is vast and substantially more complex. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, at my museum, we're really just embarking on developing a digital collecting strategy. And therefore, I have been able to do a lot of reflecting on what I actually see as the paradox, with paradoxes, plural, within this field. Um, they're kind of like wicked problems that digital collecting is confronting us with, but um, I think are ultimately pushing our institutions to change in productive and very interesting ways. Now, the first paradox of digital collecting um, I see is that it challenges us basically to keep the ephemeral forever, right? Now, it's important to know that when I say collecting, I mean something pretty specific and honestly a little bit hardcore, okay? To me, digital collecting is the formal accession with a deed of gift of digital material. 
Now that digital material could be images, websites, PDFs, video games, it could be whole code bases, databases, right? And I just want to be clear um, that this is sometimes a point of confusion, but it's, it's not the hard drives or the game cartridges or any of the physical carriers that, that hold those digital assets that, that could hold, sometimes there is no carrier, um, but I am talking about the formal accession of bits and bytes, like those are the digital objects that we're talking about. And by accessioning them, what institutions, especially like mine at the Smithsonian, what we're kind of known for is we are making a commitment to caring for those digital objects pretty much forever. That, that's actually kind of the policy, more or less, persistent long-term access forever. Now, the challenge there, as I alluded to in the paradox, is that we are talking about inherently exceptionally fragile materials. And just to put that in perspective, as a point of comparison, the oldest object believed to be at the Smithsonian is this fragment of a meteorite. It is 4.5 billion years old. And um, I think you will agree, based on this photo, it is looking pretty good for being 4.5 billion years old. <laughs> And at my museum, one of my favorite objects is Abraham Lincoln's top hat. This object dates to the mid 19th century. It is made of silk, which is a natural material. So you can see here in this photo, right? It has some wear and tear. It certainly requires, you know, long-term preservation attention. But on the other hand, I think you'll agree that it, given its age, it is in remarkable condition. It's still very much intact and it retains its power as a material culture object. Contrast these two examples with anything that was created or presented online in Adobe Flash, okay? Because as of last year, the end of 2020, they announced um, that Adobe Flash is not supported at all. It's over, it is dead, right? And that makes the total lifespan of Flash objects about 25 years, right? Less than 25 years. Um, very few physical objects suffer this kind of total loss in this short of a time frame. So whether we're talking about scratch CDs or out of business websites like Friendster or LiveJournal, you know, digital material is inherently at risk material. In fact, um, as I think was mentioned earlier, a lot of the time it's made to be ephemeral. It's like this tension at the heart of preservation is the fact that this content is not meant to be kept long term. So the way we handle this issue is digital preservation is a process of constant and active intervention to prevent against data loss. So this chart shows um, some of what happens basically to preserve a digital object for its entire life. And you don't need to read this or zoom in on the details or understand any of this jargon to understand basically that um, it's pretty labor intensive. This is a long-term commitment, as I mentioned. Um, we also have a number of specialized technologies that have been deployed um, and developed in the past uh, several years um, to support these digital preservation processes. These are just a few of the tools that are available. Um, I've included a link in the bottom right hand corner here if you're interested in the mechanics of digital preservation. There is a whole world uh, from digital forensics tools to software emulators and um, uh, email archiving. There's a lot of amazing stuff that's out there. Um, but, you know, they all do require special skills and expertise to install and then apply to collections over time. So you're probably picking up on a theme here, uh, an, an, an undercurrent, um, which is that even though digital objects don't require any of the physical infrastructure that we need for physical collections, like in that famous scene of Indiana Jones, right, this massive warehouse of materials, uh, digital content still require a lot of resources. And indeed, I would say that the key to solving this particular paradox is for institutions to strategically invest in new infrastructure. You know, realistically, that means we have to make some hard choices about how we allocate funding, whether that's between different kinds of collections, physical or digital, between staff and departments. It's, it's sort of the cold, hard truth, right? Um, but it also means that we can consider partnerships uh, for combining strengths, working with multiple institutions to jointly meet some of these challenges. Now, the second paradox I see in digital collecting is that we have to somehow define what we're collecting as we're collecting it. 
Um, and let me unpack this a little bit. So when we collect physical objects in archival documents, what we're collecting, I think, usually is pretty self-evident. Obviously, there's a lot of foresight that goes into what we collect, even in the physical space. But it's pretty clear from the get-go, you know, how many objects we're talking about what they're made of, how big they are, right? And then barring some specialized circumstances, there's a pretty standard path for what's gonna happen next, right? We're gonna catalog them, we're gonna put them on a shelf or a drawer or a, you know, a larger storage space. We will likely exhibit them. Um, increasingly, of course, museums, libraries, archives are also photographing them, putting them online, right, for, for broad public access. Um, for digital, though, the landscape is a little bit different. And I'm gonna actually, show again some slides that I showed earlier. Um, but this time, um, I'd like you to kind of start asking yourself as you look at them, what is the object here? What is it that we would be collecting as a memory institution? And what paths would we likely take for preserving them and making them accessible? And you don't have to have a lot of technical background here to, I think, you know, enter this mind space and do a little bit of thinking about that. So with Animal Crossing, are we talking about the whole game and making it playable in the future? Are we talking about video captures of specific vignettes or um, different storylines that exist in this universe? Or like, you know, was discussed earlier, how about objects within the game, right? These are assets that you can actually buy and you can add to your collection in Animal Crossing. Is, is that the subject of, you know, the research and, and therefore the museum's collection? For the DNC, you know, is the object the footage of the whole event as it was televised? Um, or is it perhaps the individual stories that comprised it, some of the raw footage? For the Vaccine Finder website, you know, are screen grabs enough? Or is it important to have the interactive experience of actually using this website, right? What about the change history of this website? Because the states, of course, have been rolling out different and more information. The website has been changing. The site that we would collect today is very different than the site that existed two weeks ago. It's probably different than the site that would exist two weeks from now. So what are we collecting here? All of them? One of them? The last one? Kind of depends. When we talk about social media, you know, I, I go back to this idea constantly of are we talking about collecting single tweets? the media involved with those tweets? Um, is it important to have the contextualized branding of the social media environments or is it just the text? Is it the whole account for a person or organization? Or what about hashtags as data sets, what I've presented here, and actually what's actually happening? Um, this particular endeavor has been attempted to curate a group of almost 42 million tweets with the Black Lives Matter hashtag and other related hashtags and actually contradictory hashtags. And it has been made available in a gigantic downloadable CSV file that is now open for you know, data and research. NFTs. All right, to be honest, I'm going to tell y'all, these get a big sigh from museum people right now. Um, I think there are some interesting things to unpack around provenance, around the blockchain and its potential possibly for, um, you know, authenticating digital files. And I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A. But I think for the most part, folks are kind of waiting to see how this plays out and, and are pretty skeptical that institutions would actually be collecting NFTs. There's, there's a, a little bit of skepticism, I would say, on that part. All right, so you know, what do we do about this question? Like, what is the object? That is a massive question that requires a lot of thinking. And I would argue that you actually have to ask a bunch of other questions before you're able to actually engage with that big one. Um, these are some of the ones that I've been thinking about as a practitioner at an institution that's you know just starting to really uh, develop a framework for doing this. The first is, what about this digital object or what it documents is at risk of loss? What is the gap in the historical record that we are looking to fill? And does that suggest a particular dimension of what it is that we want to collect, right? Secondly, what kind of magic could happen if we collected it, you know, in our institution, right? And that's a conceptual question, like what kinds of meanings would this asset object take on in conversation with the rest of our collection? But it's also a technical and a capacity question too, because it's based on our systems and our capacity and what we can do. You know, how would we be serving this up for people in exciting ways um, or not so exciting ways, you know, depending on our goals? Third, does the object have artifactual value or information value, or maybe both? Uh, some sister questions to this one are, does it have a history or does it document history? Um, and those two questions sort of point me to a question that I'm 
pretty obsessed with actually at the moment, which is, is this digital asset a museum object or is it an archival record? Depending on the answer, we might collect and treat this digital content in really wildly different ways. We might treat it as a, an insular object that is cataloged singularly, or it needs to be part of a group of archival records potentially. And that's going to change a lot of downstream about how we actually handle the material. Finally, do people need to access it, experience it, or use it? And I know these sound kind of similar, but I think the longer you spend thinking about them, the more you realize these are very different types of applications and use cases for digital content. Are these things going to happen online or in on-site spaces or both? These are uh, different ways of thinking about you know, what one does with digital content. Um, and what I'm kind of getting at here is there's a million dollar question that is underneath all of these, which is who are we collecting it for and why? To me, frankly, audience is the key to all of this. Um, it's the understanding of audience that is basically a prerequisite for knowing what it is that we are collecting and the approaches we're going to take to preserving and making it accessible. Now, I know this can be kind of abstract, so I wanted to provide an example of um, actually another example, because I think actually the panelists earlier, uh, we saw a little bit of this thinking in action. Uh, but this is an example of something that I think kind of stretches us to think in these kinds of ways. Um, in 2013, so this is actually quite an old example, um, illustrating the institutions of engaging with this for quite some time, um, the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, which is also a Smithsonian uh, Museum, collected an iPad app called Planetary. And what this app was, was an alternative music player for your iPad that would visualize your music as bodies in space, moons and stars and stuff. Um, and it is an app that they actively stopped updating, you know, knowingly said we are not going to update in 2012. So it was very much at risk. Um, and what the Cooper Hewitt did is they didn't just get screen grabs of the app and they didn't actually try to emulate the app for any kind of um, uh, a user experience, what they did is they collected the source code. They bundled up all of the versions of the app, all of the graphics that were involved in it, and interestingly too, also all of the release notes, so the ways that the developers communicated and the designers, how they decided to make the product. Um, and in addition to keeping it in their preservation repository, they put it on GitHub and they actually made it open source. That was a discussion with the donor, the app developer, and it was a you know, a, a decision on behalf of both of them to make that the case. And by making the code open source, it meant that anyone can work with it and build on it over time. You can actually go there now. Um, and it, they actually stated, the Cooper Hewitt stated in their decision making and in their writing about this project, that part of their goal here was to actually involve their public in the long-term preservation of this digital object. Now, what I like about this is it centers audience, right? And it centers this museum's audience of designers and product developers, makers, basically, um, and in their desire to build new things and to be innovative. And so I think it does something that is both feasible, but also really creative, that inspires a true and really different kind of engagement with the digital object that they collected. All right, now the last paradox I wanna introduce is the idea that just because we can collect it, should we? Uh, this relates to the legal and quite frankly, the ethical uh, issues bound up in technology and the responsibilities I believe memory institutions have to engage with those issues in a pretty, um, pretty real way. Um, if we are going to pursue digital collecting. I think that's basically a business we have to get into is the technology ethics business if we're going to get into digital collecting. Um, I wanna kick off this sex section with um, a website that you might be familiar with called I Know Where Your Cat Lives. Uh, this is a great, but I will warn you, kind of scary project <laughs> um, that highlights a common privacy issue that we see online. So the creator of the site uses completely legal public APIs to grab images of cats that people have tagged as cats um, and that they have made publicly accessible through sites like Instagram. Um, and so I just wanna note here, this is if you have a public 
Instagram a public Twitter and you are making your images publicly accessible. Um, what she does is she puts those images on a map. And because what folks might not realize is that their geolocation data is actually embedded in those photos, uh, she can just share that location data with the world. And while the creator of this site is very careful to scrub the username and the other information um, about these photos, because this is her goal, right, is to kind of highlight this issue, uh, the implication here is anyone else could do the same thing with photos of you, photos of your family, um, and basically know exactly where you live. Now, um, I know this can be very scary, uh, and um, I just want to note that if you have a public Instagram or Twitter or something and you are sharing photos um, on those platforms, just check your settings after this presentation. You know, make sure that uh, your cats and your people are not being uh, shared with all of your geolocation data online. It's, it's a good privacy best practice. Now, another example of geolocation data in action with real world repercussions is the fact that folks were able to take advantage of Parler's API, right? That's a, that other uh, social media platform to map the movements of people at the Capitol insurrection. And they were actually able to aid the FBI. Now, depending on your perspective here, you could think this is really awesome um, or really concerning or maybe both. Um, and I will note that if you think this is really awesome, um, you just might want to pause to think about how you might feel and what you might think think if someone was doing similar data mining and location tracking um, for a Black Lives Matter action or perhaps a gathering of undocumented people, right? So kind of our perspective changes when we think about the risks and, and who might be doing um, this data tinkering effectively. Now, okay, where does this relate to memory institutions? Well, I think when we start talking about collecting data, um, and presumably making it accessible because that's effectively, you know, the mission of all of our institutions. Um, you know, we have to be aware of the risks we might be presenting to the folks who are represented in and by the data. Um, and the ethical challenges here go beyond privacy. Um, consider the prospect of documenting the Me Too movement online, right? This gets into questions like whether people intended to have their words and thoughts safe for posterity, even though they may have posted them publicly. Um, you know, do they have what uh, is increasingly called in, um, in Europe as the right to be forgotten, right? What are our rights with respect respect to kind of the long-term implications of the internet. Um, there's also a lot of talk in the field for both digital and physical collecting about the potential of re-traumatizing people when we are collecting, uh, specifically when conducting oral histories um, around sensitive topics, right? This is something that I think we have to be aware of as people engaging with these questions and these issues. Uh, the Schlesinger Library at Harvard has actually been undertaking a really ambitious project to document the Me Too movement online. And the important thing is that they are very much aware of this paradox of they can collect it, but should they collect it, okay? Um, they think very critically about the proper way to collect. They have an ethics statement. They have lawyers and ethicists on their advisory board. It is grounded in ethical practice, and it is part of the project. Um, and in fact, they have a great Zotero bibliography linked from their website if you want to dig more into these questions um, and kind of see how they are combining these different um, types of uh, strands of thought to actually do collecting like this in real time. Um, there's also lots of great work outside of the GLAM community that we can borrow from. The activist community is a great resource. Um, projects like Witness, I think, are just doing a tremendous job about, you know, providing tools for activists both to preserve their videos for, for, from protests, but also to kind of question what about those actions they should be saving long term. Um, there's a fantastic project called Documenting the Now that draws from and partners with activist communities, but is grounded in archival practice. They're combining technical and policy development to give us some real solutions, I think, to this uh, paradox and is pushing the field in some incredible ways. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects that they are undertaking. It's called Social Humans Labels. And the idea is that as a website owner or as a digital content producer, I could put one of these labels on my content to indicate my preference to memory institutions about what they archive and how, right? Um, so, you know, is it a free for all or do I want to exercise some kind of embargoes? And so what it's doing is it's starting to open up a two-way conversation between content owners and collecting institutions. Um, so there's actually a, um, a dialogue there and that uh, we are all kind of part of the same endeavor to preserve and to make accessible history long term. 
Um, the last thing I just have to mention, and I'm, I'm realizing now I think I captured the audio of this as well as the, um, I, I'm not sure if you're hearing Tom Cruise's voice as well as, my, as me, um, but <laughs> I'm going to try to talk over it. Uh, this is basically, this is deep fakes, right? Um, and I think that we have a growing responsibility potentially in our archives and memory institutions to authenticate digital content, right? You know, that has been traditionally our role. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the idea of deep fakes, this is media that is basically completely manufactured by people and using artificial intelligence. These have gotten shockingly good. So the point here is none of these are actually Tom Cruise. This is manufactured media. And it's really fun when it's Tom Cruise. It is not so fun when you think about um, the disinformation campaigns that are possible as a result of these, um, when we think about what kind of words and actions could be put in the mouths and faces of public figures and political um, you know, figures. And uh, I, I think that there's people in digital uh, have a lot of reasons to kind of be concerned about this and to see this as a growing need to address. Um, so I think the, the kind of open-ended question here is, you know, to what extent will curators and archivists and librarians need to do the same thing with this kind of material, right? Be part of the project of verifying and authenticating what is real, right, from the world of the digital. So to recap, or maybe to offer some paradox busters, because I'd like to think that, you know, we started with some paradoxes, but I think we also reached some conclusions here along the way. Um, you know, digital preservation is hard, but it is doable with resources. Um, we just need to actively push against that in endemic data loss that's always possible, right? Um, I do believe that audiences should drive what we collect and how from the digital universe. It might not always be obvious what we're collecting up front, but we should let the purpose be our guide as we do that work. Um, and finally, we need to be prepared to engage with technology ethics. Um, I think just part of our job in collecting is going to be to determine what we don't collect and other creative ways to mitigate these issues. Um, thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions. And I just also want to publicly give my thanks to my colleague, Alicia Cutler, who provided some really important input into this talk as I was juggling and honestly struggling with some of these paradoxes. Um, it really helps to have a good team of people to think with. So thank you so much. Sherry, thank you so much. That was so incredible. Hello, everyone. I'm Hope Gillespie. I'm the finance and content chair of CMSMC, and I'm going to be leading today's discussion. Um, I'd like to invite all of our panelists to um, turn on their, their cameras so that we can see all of your lovely faces. And the first question that we're going to bring up today is, is a very general question, and I'd actually like to start with Claudia uh, on this one, because I think she has the most tangible route when it comes to all of our presentations today. And that is, what does material mean in a digital world? What does tangibility mean in a digital world? And how does that change? And where are we going with that? So Claudia, whenever you're ready, please go ahead and start. Um, OK, so I guess for the purposes of my project, tangibility really meant looking at something that I could analyze from Virginia um, while doing research uh, in remote Oceania. So I was really interested in looking at, you know, sorts of monumental architecture and something that I could generally speak to without over assuming anything about um, what is happening on the ground. Um, so it really structured some of the questions that I was asking and, um, you know, sort of the methodology that I was using to answer such questions. So I think moving forward into a more digital world, it's really going to uh, you know, how, what material culture we're looking at is really going to inform different types of questions that we're asking, um, which can be, I think, really interesting way to consider um, questions that we haven't looked at before because we haven't been looking at them from a digital frame. And, and with that, I think, Abby, you might be the next great person to answer this. Looking at, the, looking at things that we usually talk about in person in a digital frame is everything that you kind of talked about. So go ahead. 
Yeah, I mean, for me, um, material culture in this increasingly digital world is giving people the opportunity, the privilege really, to experience these physical objects in a way that um, is still meaningful, even if you cannot touch them at the, at the time. Um, it's providing information about an object or cultural practices or simply giving people the chance to witness something they would never have otherwise seen, uh, whether this is taking an object and making it an ex accessible accessible to people around the globe or making it accessible to people with learning differences and disabilities who otherwise maybe could not travel to the museum and be able to experience this object in person. Awesome. Yeah. And Anna, actually, if you want to go ahead and jump in there talking about experiencing things that wouldn't have existed outside of this kind of like set of circumstances and that you don't necessarily experience in person. Yeah, I mean, I think with, um, I mean, even just in the creation of the archive for Fleur and I, like digital material culture meant um, capturing as best as we could in a digital manner, a lot of times things that were physical. Um, but at the same time, looking at things which were conceptual and would have only have been able to be created, you know, sort of like, con like architectural concepts or product concepts that have only ever existed in digital. Um, and so for me, sort of digital material culture is really looking at what are the opportunities um, as sort of like cultural heritage institutions or researchers to work with that material, um, both sort of on a theoretical sort of level um, and analysis level, but also on the sort of methodology, you know, dirty, how do you actually get it done level? Yeah. Um, and what kind of excites me about the field at large is sort of looking at what are those, um, how, how will that progress in the next, you know, five, 10, 20 years um, as we're seeing a lot of, you know, um, debates around it arising, um, especially having um, been catalyzed by the pandemic. And Erica and Kale kind of jumping into that as well, both of you are talking about things that are very grounded in the physical, you know, women's history is very grounded in the physical. A lot of the derivatives that you were talking about in the video games are grounded in the physical. So how does that tangibility translate into both of your projects and what does that mean to you? Um, well, I'll just uh, step in there real fast. Uh, a couple things. I'm I'm thinking about the fact that it levels the playing field on multiple levels. You know what Abby brought up. You know of of giving access to people, especially general public. You know that maybe don't have uh, or are not studying, or maybe they you know just want to look at one person that they've heard of and want to find out more information. I think it's a le it levels the playing field. It also does that for, for us researchers, because for those of us who are not in a program yet, or even if you are, and even if it's not a pandemic, you know, sometimes it's just, it's cost prohibitive and just logistically prohibitive to get on a plane and cross the world time and time again, in order to be able to go to see these artifacts in person. I mean, that'd be great, but you know, sometimes it's just not gonna work. So I think being able to have things digitally accessible just really helps with all of the above. I guess for me, it's, it's a world uh, based around the image, right? It's, it's a universe wherein people use those images um, to create new things. And it's a world just in general that that obfuscates originals. I think in not necessarily a bad way that I think a lot of people would consider it as, but in a way that is distinctly new. And I think because of that, really, really scary for some people. Um, it's a new sort of materiality, um, one that is needing description, um, needing people to come through and define it. But like, I mean, just, the sheer rate at which people are are crunching data, making memes, um, you know, building out. Uh, so there was when I when I worked on this on this Bioshock project, I I could not tell you how many times people would literally rip the assets out of the games, rip the objects out of Bioshock to make their own little scenes and environments and things like that. It's just it's a new space and it's a new space where everybody's working with the same tools, materials, um, everybody's working with the same source material or, or it's at least accessible. Um, and like, uh, like my fellow panelists said, I mean, it is, it is a level playing field. Uh, a 13 year old can jump in and work at the same level as an animator um, working for Pixar if they know how to do it and they watch the right tutorials and they practice hard enough, right? I mean, that's kind of an amazing thing and it really rewards creativity. So yeah, I hope that answers somewhat. Yeah, and, and Sherry, I just want to toss it back to you for, for the final answer to this question. Um, where where do you is 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 where you sit 
and you know in the Smithsonian and in kind of this this grandiose place of of collecting how does that materiality translate into a digital sphere yeah I this is such a huge question I I think I I think it probably permeates a lot of what we do, probably not even kind of consciously, you know, and, and I think a lot of what I'm grappling with and trying to figure out is, is, is where that is the case. And then also where, of course, because I, you know, this is my business, right? Where, where to then put the resources behind that. And I guess I would say, you know, I mentioned that I'm kind of obsessed with this idea of archival object, you know, uh, museum object versus archival and it, uh, artifactual value versus informational value. I tend to, and maybe I'm a bit of a traditionalist, but I tend to kind of fall back on those kind of core core ideas because I think underneath all of this, um, you know, we, we've got some, we've got some philosophy to go from and we've got some kind of sense of things. And where I tend to, I, where my mind tends to go is it starts to become a little bit of, um, you know, poles where there's kind of the idea of material culture and trying to produce and reproduce the experience of technology and 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 kind of living in an environment of that, you know, which is it's it's almost, you know, we live two lives now, you know, and then those lives intersect. And I really think a lot about kind of where are we in attempting to capture that kind of feeling, I guess would be almost how I would describe that versus, and I, I, I'm saying versus, but of course they can be overlapping and, and, and have all of these interesting intersections. But where, where are we talking about digital is not actually being something that's all that different than what we've done in the past because, okay, it's documenting something or it, it's, it's, you know, saying, it's either visual or audio or something that is is you know documentary in a way that we need that information textual whatever it is to build on that knowledge base for the future right and so i i think i think i see things in these two kind of camps but then of course every time everywhere i look there's something that challenges that <laughs> so i think it's a really hard question and, and i guess i would echo what i think it was that kale said earlier which is like maybe our definitions have to change you know maybe we have to kind of define materiality differently or we have to um you know kind of define material culture differently but it's worth digging into what we mean when we mean by material culture or, or, you know, any of these terms that we have been so comfortable with in the physical form for so long. You know, I think, in other words, I think they're still, they're still important and there's something to kind of grab onto, but we have to revisit them and refine them as we encounter these new kinds of media, basically. Yeah, no, and that actually leads us into a, a, the next question, which is a practical question that I'm going to combine into kind of one whole big idea. Um, when we're talking about creating archives, number one, what is the hardest thing that we kind of come up against? Because we do have to kind of reconsider things like copyright. And I can speak from experience in knowing that copyright and image rights are the absolute worst thing on the planet. They take up six hours of my week every week for publication. So how do we kind of redo these, these, these really big things that we have to deal with that are based in a material place and then archiving them in a digital space. And Anna, I think I'm gonna start with you on this and everyone feel free to jump in. Sure, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I, the reason I kept saying in the presentation was like, you know, if you have any experience in digital archive, please come, please email us, please reach out because it's something that Fleur and I have definitely as sort of amateurs, um, you know, are discovering as we're doing it. You know, I think one of the challenges of kind of, what we decided to do was that, um, you know, we didn't really have any experience in digital archiving prior to starting this. We just thought that it was most important to just start collecting some stuff somewhere as quickly as possible. Uh, so I think the, the real challenge, I think, uh, is making sure that, you know, incorporating this into education. I mean, I think, you know, the fact that our course like I mentioned in the presentation, really puts um, a lot of backing behind this idea of history as public practice. Um, and originally, a lot of that had to do with putting up a physical exhibition at the RCA, right? Like we we I, we were in the middle of planning a physical exhibition when the pandemic happened, um, and then kind of had to switch gears into doing something digital. Um, and 
however, like the education around, you know, how do you actually set up a digital archive? What are, you know, the tools that you need to preserve metadata? Um, you know, how do you navigate digital copyright? All of these things was not, you know, something that, that's something that we were taught ourselves as we went along and we're still teaching ourselves. Um, so, you know, I'd really love to see more um, courses um, sort of mandatory around this, you know, all of these different issues, um, which I think will help uh, maybe mitigate some of the, some of the problems that we have as, as researchers and collectors. I think uh, if I could just jump in, I think considering this stuff in a component element model could be really useful for understanding, you know, uh, derivative material culture in general. Um, so, uh, sorry, my cat Peter's going off and it's playing uh, that TikTok song. I don't know what you're talking about where the guy turns and it's like, I don't know what you're Okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> and so um, <laughs> one thing that I need to mention is that the way Hiroki Azuma was considering copyright in Japan when he was writing his book was he was looking at how people were reusing motifs constantly in anime and manga, right? So you've got like things like cat ears, maid costumes, all of that, right? And these things are not protected by copyright in Japan necessarily, right? And so any artist can sort of reuse, pull these things, put them together, smash them together, do whatever they want with them. But here in the United States, we protect things like Mickey's ears, right? Um, different little component elements and things like that. When we could be thinking about these things more as like, as long as you're riffing on it, remixing it in a new way, maybe we need to be redefining what it means to be um, using someone else's work. Yeah, and Abby, I actually want to pivot to you on that because Creative Commons is a big deal. Like talking about, I mean, non-derivative licenses, all of those kinds of things. And I know that that's something that you deal with a lot. So... Yes. Oh man, I could I could harp on copyright all day, as I'm sure some of you know already. Um, but Creative Commons, I just find to be uh, so important and really the next step in making the internet more inclusive um, and also making research and reproduction so much easier. Um, uh, obviously, I'm not here to give a crash course in Creative Commons licensing, but if um, I don't even know where to talk from here. Um, there is just so much to say, but it just, it gives the opportunity for individual artists and creators to put something out into the world and allow people to maybe just copy it, but for free, um, as long as they give credit, always give credit, uh, or, you know, remix it and reconfigure it however they want in a way that in the United States historically has only been available for items in the public domain. So it's giving owners still that ownership of their own work, but it's also saying all of you people out there, you have this great opportunity to make art based on my art. And I feel like that is a form of of love in the community. Everyone can, you know, get together and make their art and share with one another, neighbors together. So before I go too far <laughs> off of that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Hope. I mean, the thing that immediately comes to mind for me with, with that question, and in particular, things like fan fiction and fan art that, that clearly come from like a specific place and then kind of create and make a life of their own, which I actually, the next question I think is, is going to be for Sherry, which is what are the resources and infrastructure needed for the mission of digital collecting? And in terms of human resources, how does that team look? How do we look in a digital sphere? I mean, the answer to this is, um, is a tough one. Um, it, it, we are basically, Two answers. Um, if we plan to collect in the model that our institutions have collected to date, more or less, which is, you know, my institution holds this stuff and then you come to me for that stuff, then we will have to build up parallel systems for exactly what we've built for physical collecting, we will have to do for the digital space. It is just a, um, uh, you know, it, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it, it's, we might not need the warehouses and the physical footprint, but everything else um, has to be resourced and at every level. And I am incredibly lucky to work at an institution that has, for example, a centralized digital asset management system. You know that that's um, 
like right then and there. Uh, that is not, by the way, a preservation repository. And a number of us who work in digital preservation and digital collections are even like pushing that further. And we're saying this is not sufficient. This does not fulfill our obligations, right? Like we, we want to kind of reach, because we are the Smithsonian, we want to do the best possible kind of high level digital preservation we can do. And so if you think about you know, where we are, we are still going. And then you think about like a small community archive or something. This is like, this is massive, you know? Now there are tools out there that help mitigate this. There are awesome programs that are in development. And that brings me to part two. It's like, if we are going to think anew about how we collect and we possibly approach it from a more collaborative standpoint, and we think about it maybe not necessarily as this institution owns this stuff and this institution owns this stuff and this institution owns this stuff, it opens the, the gates a little bit and more becomes possible. Um, there are some really interesting um, uh, uh, models in the world of archives like post-custodial collecting, which actually enables communities and people to hold on to their own physical artifacts and partner with a more uh, well-resourced organization to host the digital object and to kind of like facilitate a relationship with getting more information about that object, providing the data around that object. There are all sorts of collaborations and relationships between institutions that partner on kind of like, okay, you've got the data warehouse, I've got the public website, or you know what, you are, you've specialized in email archiving, like you're, you're, that's what you're going to work on, and I'm going to work on oral histories or something, right? So I, I could see this probably getting to a space where perhaps we're thinking more format by format. We talk about kind of instead of collecting based so strongly on content and subject area, we might be looking at a universe in the future where because of the resource needs, we're dividing and conquering based on areas of specialization from a pragmatic standpoint, you know, and then we're working together basically to ensure as best we can, as we have been all along, that we are doing the best possible job of preserving the historical record or in other disciplines, of course, the other types of material that we might need to preserve. So, I, I mean, it's a little bit, I, I'm, I, I speak pretty frankly about this as our institutions right now are, now are not equipped to handle the volume of material that certainly exists. And I don't believe even to handle the kind of ambition that we have to collect in that space. Yeah, and, that, and that's a problem specifically as an archeologist, you know, we constantly struggle with, do we, do we pull more things out of the ground or do we, do we work more with archives and like, where do we go with that? And it's a big struggle because I personally am a big fan of excavation. Um, but the next question is actually for Erica, but I'm going to open it up to everybody because it is about reference points. So specifically when you're talking about the women in your database, I got really excited, by the way, when I saw Amandiris and Hypatia, two of my favorite historical ladies. Um, but how do we kind of create a reference point that is inclusive of as many different cultural markers and, and names and like including as many narratives as humanly possible? So however you want to start to answer that huge question. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the short answer is, uh, I'll get back to you when the dissertation is finished. Um, but uh, really, something that I, because that was something I was concerned about, absolutely. And, you know, like, for example, with the uh, time period category, you know, I, I really thought about that, because a lot of times, people say, well, you know, did the Middle Ages start at this year or at this year? Also, what is Middle Ages? I chose not to say Middle Ages, for example, because that's more Euro Eurocentric. And so medieval is relatively more accepted as a time frame. Obviously, though, that's still not representative enough. So it is definitely something that I am constantly thinking about. And for me, I plan to really try to consult other people who really think about all this stuff. The people who spend their career going, how do I use certain terminologies? Who is excluded by using other terminologies and categories? So I think since I'm at the beginning of my research with this, I feel like that is one of the big questions that I'm, I'm kind of always asking myself but don't have a firm grasp on personally, um, though it is something that I think all of us need to take into consideration, uh, even if we're focusing just on, a, say, a specific area or location or even person, it, by using certain terminology, it absolutely can affect 
positively and very negatively other groups of people. And for me, my whole point to all of this is that I'm trying to gather information that people don't know of so they can learn about it about women. But then, uh, you know, we're, I'm trying to increase knowledge and not exclude. So it is, it is another paradox of how do I get, look at words from the past, but then say, how do I reinterpret this? How do I redefine it? Maybe we do need to come up with new definitions for a lot of this. So that's my longer answer. <laughs> Um, does anyone else want to take a shot at kind of like reference points talking about, you know, yeah, Anna, do you want to go ahead and yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to jump on that point, I mean, one of the things in terms of looking at like, uh, that's something that we definitely asked ourselves at the beginning of the project, Fleur and I was, was you know, this is the, the gamut of sort of pandemic related design responses is such a huge, you know, range of material. Um, it's it's sort of the challenge of rapid response collecting is, is A, how do you decide what goes in? um before figuring out whether or not it really is historically significant and then also um how do you actually physically you know or how, how do you as a human have the capacity to sit there and find it all um and one of the things we tried to make very clear was what where are our limits and saying that like we you know this is where we're based this is our education this is who we are um and you know putting basically i think we even said that um maybe on the website in the about page is, is just making it very clear what your physical um, and sort of cultural limitations are um, as researchers or collectors or what have you. Um, and then being really open to collaboration and saying, you know, if you'd like to submit anything from anywhere in any language, get in touch, we'll be happy to do it. Um, which I think has been, you know, a way to, um, you know, help, help make it clear that you know, we were open to and still are open to, to, to anything, um, but that we ourselves are, are limited in our capacities. Can I ask add one more uh, point to that? And that is something that I'm sure other people have come across is if, especially if you're looking for uh, information that is harder to find, you know, where there's not a lot of details or documentation at all, it, it becomes a tricky business of trying to figure out, okay, I found this thing online, is it real? How do you authenticate it? And that has also been a really a question for me personally. Um, but I think, you know, so for example, if I'm if I'm looking for uh, Hypatia, for example, actually, I did not include an, include an image of her because all of these different kinds of, not just physical image, but for me, the database is about looking for images of the objects that they're creating, not necessarily the women themselves. So I couldn't find an image that, that I trusted to say, this is the thing that she made. And, and even that's murky among people that spend their careers studying her. So I think that this brings up this whole other kind of question of, okay, great. I talked to these people. I found the, the, the artifacts online. There's digitization here. But then if I dig deeper and say, oh, great grandmother's, you know, artifact it's it, it it was in the civil war or something great but how do i authenticate that you know so this is i don't have an answer quite frankly that's a, a, a thing i keep coming up against and so when you are just doing digital i do think it opens a door but also shuts one really quickly as soon as you step through so that's actually where I wanted to take the next question. Um, as an archaeologist, I look at a lot of things in the sense of, is there going to be a gap in kind of what we see in the material record? And, and digitally, that is, a, that can, that's a huge concern, you know, or, or are we going to, you know, be a quote unquote lost settlement and then suddenly there's just nothing here and we just have these like boxes and everyone's like, what is this? Because we can't access what's inside or whatnot. So is there actually an inaccessibility that comes with the digitalization? And Sherry, I wanna start with you on this um, and then maybe go to Claudia who, you know, understands kind of what I think I'm trying to get at with, with losing kind of that tangibility. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it is a real risk um, in some respects. I, I think, you know, there, I think that the field has grown, and, and again, from a practitioner perspective, I, I think we're kind of, we're getting there. You know, we've developed some methods. I think it's going to depend on, you know, our organizational strategies and that kind of thing. I think we're gonna have to get used to the idea that we are not gonna save everything. And, and I think that's actually something that we'll be okay with because we've been used to that idea. Like we didn't collect everything physically either, right? You know, I think we wanna avoid whole, you know, 
spans of time, right? Which I think you're you're getting at. And um, I, I think that though we've probably experienced some of that already in the kind of digital dark ages of, you know, like the 90s, right? You know, we, we have that, that is a real risk. And honestly, that kind of AV and optical disc media is probably the most at risk content that we have right now, even more so I would argue than the content that is being produced online. Um, I think that we have possibly a little bit more leeway right now with what's going on. Um, and, and I think it also kind of gets at, I don't know if this exactly answers your question, but one of the things that I struggle with a lot is I, the space between rapid response collecting and the urgency of getting this stuff now before it goes away, and also the thoughtfulness and the kind of thinking and and sometimes the distance you have to have from historical events and 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 our lives to be able to qualify what's even worth saving and is important to this moment i i think that in some respects is you know it's probably a paradox i should have mentioned which is like the the tension that exists here is we're hustling and we're like, oh my God, this stuff's gonna go away because it's so inherently fragile and we don't want to have another digital dark age. But on the other hand, do we really have the skills we need just as people who are living in this moment to always be able to know which of that's that material we want to keep? And so I think that's a tension at the heart of this. And we're all kind of doing our best. We're acting on our expertise. You know, we're acting on these processes that we have developed and our historical uh, knowledge. And, and I think lessons like you're describing around, okay, well, this is a whole civilization that's been lost, or this is a whole part of the human record that we really don't understand. So we're doing our best at it. So I do think there's a risk, but I think, you know, there's there's methodologies and ways that we can mitigate that and be really thoughtful about, you know, um, you know, finding a way forward effectively. Um, yeah, I, I, I um, agree with definitely with what you're saying, Sherry, um, just to kind of add on to that, I think a big part of like my research because I only have like three different sources that I'm really drawing from from the past is that you know I look at this research and I go oh I wish they had collected you know xyz I wish they had looked at this I wish they had looked at that but they didn't and a big part of the reason for that is like they didn't know you know 40 years in the future that somebody's going to be using GIS to like analyze that and I think that that's something that you know we can really Think about now about how you know the questions that we're asking aren't necessarily going to be interesting questions in the future and the methodologies that we're using aren't going to be interesting or useful in the future or maybe they will be but we don't have like you know uh the future vision or whatever to um to know what sorts of things people are going to be interested in. and that's kind of just like a major problem that i think everybody's really facing um but I do think that, you know, the more data we collect, the better off, hopefully, um, future researchers will be as they as they try to integrate past research. Um, taking these this sort of question in a, in a little bit of a different direction, but also in line with it, right, is I think there's this, this thought that people aren't getting like the quote unquote full experience of an object when they're looking at it online. But like, people aren't like looking at stuff like you can't handle like I don't know what, what universe we're living in where everybody can get their hands on an object you know and play with it and look at it and like I don't know in my context put it into a game world and, and hit it on a wall or you know break glass with it right like the way in which that you're able to interface with these things in these digital formats could be argued to be better than the user experience of somebody just walking around a museum. Um, and also too, you're able to get a really up close look. You're able to turn something around, look at it, uh, get details, things like that. I would say what's lost might be the material qualities, like the weight of the thing, the stuff that only us as people who can touch it really get to know anyway. So I don't know, it's, I think capturing that is going to somehow capturing that, I don't know how we're going to do it, is going to enrich their experience, you know, but, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not the, it's not that simple, I think, you know, as losing something. Yeah, no, I think that that's absolutely brilliant. And that's also something that until you said it, I was coming at it from a very like, I'm so used to being able to pick things up. Like it's my, like that's my privilege showing. Um, but does anyone have any final thoughts before I turn it over for closing remarks? Nope. All right, guys, you have been wonderful and incredible. I just wanna remind everyone that we have a social hour at 1.30. 
um, that hopefully I will see everyone at. But for right now, I'm going to turn it over to CMSMC editor Molly Radford for closing remarks. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that wonderful discussion. Uh, my name is Molly Radford, as Hope said, and I am a member of the CMSMC Symposium Committee. As our lives have moved from the classroom to Zoom, from working in the library to working from home, as we're all doing right now, <laughs> so too have our research and research practices evolved. While this past year has accelerated the digital shift, material culture in an increasingly digital world also seeks to answer how we might incorporate technological innovations into the study of material culture at large. Our panelists today have provided great insight into the infinite possibilities of digital transformation. Claudia has demonstrated how GIS can break down the barriers to studies of remote archeological sites. And Kale has explored how digital objects themselves become records of historic materials. Abigail has set forth a paradigm for creating the online exhibit, while Anna and Erica have elucidated how we might put these principles into practice, both to preserve artifacts from the present and to recover gaps in the history of women's material culture. Lastly, Sherry has illuminated the paradoxes of digital collecting, as well as how, why, and for whom digital collections should be created. Thank you again for all of our, to all of our panelists. Following today's symposium, we have a social hour beginning at 1.30 Eastern, where you're all welcome to join and chat with the, the panelists and other attendees. Mary and Kate will be sharing the Zoom link in the chat. Lastly, don't forget to check out our symposium merch on our bonfire shop, which will be up through the end of the month. Thank you again for joining and enjoy the rest of your day.